Well, indeed, thank you for staying with us here on Farm Kenya. On this second part of the show, we want to get into a discussion, as we had indicated earlier. Of course, the fact that uh, food security and indeed food safety remains a crucial conversation for many, many different people. It is of concern for most of us. And of course, a topic that uh, we will keep coming back to repeatedly. I'll uh, introduce my guests in studio, of course, who are experts in this field, uh, bringing uh, uh, various different aspects to this conversation. And I'll start at my far left. Uh, Dr. Alice Kemunto is Executive Director of the Consumer Grassroots Association. It is an independent, non-political and non-profit organization that is committed to uh, grassroots consumer protection through education, research and evidence-based advocacy in Kenya. And then, of course, we have Simon Ndongo, uh, Samuel Ndongo, rather. He is the programs manager at the Kenya Organic Agriculture Network, that is CON. Uh, it is an organization that is of national membership uh, for organic agriculture in Kenya and was formed to coordinate, facilitate, and provide leadership and professional services to all members and other stakeholders in the agricultural industry in Kenya. And then, of course, we have Luis Leki Omondi. He is from Jaipur Farm Solutions, and their core mandate is to provide uh, agri uh, professional agribusiness consultancy services and support farmers in realizing the full potential in agribusiness, seedless, seedling production, and landscaping work. Uh, Karibuni to you all, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to start off with uh, uh, Dr. Alice, and the fact of the matter has been that uh, we have heard a lot about f uh, food safety in Kenya. Uh, first off, of course, the fact that uh, uh, from time to time you hear conversations around this is not safe for you to eat. Uh, there's a challenge around that. Uh, even from the general perspective, how important is food safety even for people's uh, peace of mind first and then secondly health? As you've right, uh, right to put it, is that uh, uh, food safety is uh, critical and essential for the peace of mind of yes. uh, consumers in Kenya, uh -huh. and not only in Kenya, but also beyond. Yes. Uh, consumer organizations such as Consumer Grassroots Association, and now we have one consumer uh, umbrella organization that we have formed uh -huh. that is very keen on food safety, and that is the COC, that the Coalition of Consumer Organizations. Yes. So any consumer organization uh, that we have in Kenya, uh, the key key role and key mandate is just to ensure that consumers are protected as uh, uh, enshrined in the constitution. Yes. And when you're talking about food safety is a key issue and uh, uh, this is something that everybody should be talking about it anywhere, whether you're on the road, you're you, you at home, you're at workplace, food safety is key because we are what we eat. And uh, for us to have a population that is uh, healthy, mm -hmm. then we have to take care of what the population is consuming. Uh -huh. For consumer, from the consumer perspective, what consumers are looking for are five things. One, uh, the accessibility of the food, yes. affordability of this same food, availability of the food, safety of that food, and sustainability of the food. And those are the five key areas that we are looking at. Even as a consumer grassroots association, mm -hmm. we uh, mostly we don't produce, but we are from the demand side of the coin. And our job is simple, is to mount pressure and to demand, generate demand for f safe food in the market. Mm -hmm for us and for our future generations. And when we consume safe food, I believe even the byproduct that comes out of us is also food is also good for the environment. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole um, uh, it's a holistic approach that you wa we are taking as an organization to uh -huh. ensure that the environment is safe, the soil is safe, the people are safe, so that the whole ecosystem is happy. Mm -hmm. yes. I want to bring in Samuel, and the fact of the matter is that uh, as countries have evolved, as the world has developed, uh, food production used to be a personal thing where you'd have your little garden or you'd go hunting, gathering, foraging. As we have industrialized, uh, this has become, uh, we now have uh, supply chains, we have value chains, and it's becoming more and more difficult for people to control uh, what they eat, how it's produced, where it, uh, whose hands it passes through, uh, especially because of uh, specialization and that sort of thing. How much control can a person retain of this, uh, essentially? Yeah, I mean, 
you know, when you look at the global uh, food food chains mm -hmm. as we have them today, uh, you know, we have been moving to from a system where uh, food is produced in a system where it is more holistic, uh, you yes. know, more healthy, less inputs, mm -hmm. to more commercially oriented, uh, high inputs, yes. uh, and, uh, you know, with chemicals and uh, fertilizers. And, and therefore, as, as consumers, uh, lose the, the whole, uh, you know, traceability system mm -hmm. and uh, control of the food. Yes. And I think we appreciate because we are in an environment where the, you know, in the industrialization, where people have moved from the rural areas to the mm -hmm cities yes and they can no longer produce their own food mm -hmm. so they have to uh, consume what uh, they're getting from the market or from the shops mm -hmm. and therefore they may not be able to control unless uh, a converted effort from the government civil society and the private sector mm -hmm. so that we have standards in place and then we have uh, surveillance of the standards uh, implementation and therefore what consumer is going to buy from the market yes is something that is uh, standardized uh, it is certified, mm -hmm. and therefore it is safe for him to eat. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I I even as we talk about losing control, and of course uh, now depending on other people to produce your own food, that then presents an opportunity for farmers, uh, Luis. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that uh, our food production is now big business. So how then do we ensure that the farmers who we have producing our food are properly, uh, well, capacitated to understand what's good for us, what is not, and then of course to put... Uh, passion before profit, so that we then have food that is safe. Uh, th thank you, uh, Buena Peter. Uh, one of the things we need to understand from the production level is that uh, farmers basically get seeds which are certified, and the certifying bodies, which are the kefis and the kebs, mm -hmm. they deal with uh, a lot of standardization of seeds and uh, making sure that uh, the seeds that are released into the hands of the farmers are good uh, for producing the crops that are needed in the general chain of production of healthy foods, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that uh, we realize what is called the food safety. Uh, I would basically say that the attention of the farmers towards getting the seeds that are certified, that are approved, is very key and essential at the point of production. Mm -hmm. Because if we do not get certified seeds as farmers, then eventually we will uh, break the, the whole chain of producing healthy foods, uh, which will be consumed by the final consumer. So it's uh, up to the farmers to make sure where they get the seeds. These are, these are places or these are revenues which are highly recognized, which are highly approved. For example, uh, when you go to an agrovet, for instance, to buy a seed, it's up to the farmer to check if the seed is certified because if you buy a seed that is not certified the end product of it will be to re releasing foods into the market which is not uh, approved mm -hmm. uh, so this has this will uh, eventually uh, bridge that gap of profitability and passion whereby uh, most farmers are driven by passion uh, not just necessarily profit as much as profit is also very important but uh, we normally say that farming is more about passion uh, before profit comes in, because mm -hmm. there are a lot of challenges that comes through uh, during the at the production level. So it's very important for the farmers to consider the efficiency or the quality of seeds from the source. Mm -hmm. That is the agrovets and also the the, the, the the organizations or the companies that produce the seeds. Mm -hmm. For example, the seed co, the Kenya seed companies, yes. uh, the Simlos, the Abiran. So it's very key for the farmers to know where they get the seeds. Uh, before they look at the profitability. It is the seeds that will eventually make the farmer rea realize a good profit. Yes, yes. Mm. Uh, I want to bring in Alice. Uh, and essentially, uh, as we say, qua ground, eh? uh, the reality of it is that many African farmers uh, don't necessarily have the capacity to interrogate what is certified and what is not. Uh, they mostly have not interacted firsthand with global level chemicals. They simply know brand names and that sort of thing. So essentially don't have the capacity than to do the things that uh, Louis is talking about. So from where you sit and with your role in terms of advocacy, how then uh, have you and how can you uh, go out and uh, essentially start to try and ensure that we first, of course, get the right chemicals in our space? Uh, we keep hearing about uh, chemicals that have been banned globally but are readily available in East Africa. And this get into our food systems. 
uh, people asking uh, if this thing is supposed to be causing cancer in a certain place, why should it be in our space? And are we eating it? Are we then exposed uh, unwittingly? I think so much. You've really asked me so much in just a yeah. few sentences. Huh? Uh, but before I respond to that, I would want also to um, uh, reiterate that consumers are the largest constituency we have around. Consumers um, form a larger percentage uh -huh. of any other uh, value chain actor in the food value uh, chain uh, production, right from production to consumption. So yeah. we form the largest uh -huh. number. And since we are the largest, apparently, Vitu Kwa Ground, as you said, they are different. Yes. Vitu Kwa Ground are different in the sense that when it comes to making decisions on what is affecting the consumer, the food value uh, system, uh, actually consumers are not consulted. Uh -huh. And that has left a big and huge gap because these conversations of food safety, the conversations of sustainable food systems transformations consumers are not involved and this is the reason why we are experiencing these issues uh, of uh, food uh, and safe food around and safe products around because consumers are not really well trained well um, there's no capacity building that has been done uh -huh. so that consumers can be able to tell what they're supposed to be purchasing from the market uh -huh. so it's uh, difficult for most of them not all of them for most of them to tell the difference between what is right and what's wrong in them market because what they go for mostly when we do our own surveys is the affordability yes. and uh, it's really not necessarily that what is affordable is safe for uh -huh. you so coming to um how we are trying to ensure that consumers get this information to begin with us as consumer grassroots association we have also devolved our functions mm -hmm. now we are in six counties in this country and we have consumer desks all those counties where we are partnered with the government whether the local county government depending on where we are like in busia we've been given a, a space by the national government mm -hmm. in homa bay we begin a, a space by the county government and that's how we are partnered even here in nairobi and Kajiado County and uh, Kilifi and uh, Narrow Counties. So those are the counties right now we are working on. But if we get more resources, we want to devolve to all the counties as having physical consumer desks. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? Those consumer desks act as uh, advisory centers for consumers. If they need any information about food safety, food production and all that, they come and get information from there. And we also hold what we call consumer parliaments in all those counties where we get an opportunity to get the dude bearers and the uh, consumers in one space mm -hmm. to share their issues. And through that, the dude bearers are now able to explain to consumers what what to look for when they go to the market. Mm -hmm. And uh, we take complaints also from consumers and once yes. we get the complaints, we channel them to the right uh, uh, the relevant authorities to handle those complaints. That's how now we are trying to do that alongside us using our social media platforms and uh, also doing advocacy through what we publish. So basically that's what we do. And yes. in the quest of inbound, trying to promote safe food. Us as Consumer Grassroots Association has come out very strong in uh, supporting agroecology. Mm -hmm. We are supporting agroecology because it's safe for us as human beings, safe for the environment, safe for everybody. And it assures sustainability. Even after we are gone, there will be a sustainable production of food for those that are coming after us. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about seeds and maybe getting uh, certified seeds, as my colleague league said mm -hmm. yes in one way as consumer uh, lobby groups we are well aware that this article 46 of the constitution yes. and that consumer has a right to information but also has a right to choose you know when we go and get just only certified seeds what sort of seeds are, are those yeah i know that farmers need to be respected out there yes. that farmers are the ones that are making us to wake up even today morning you had breakfast before coming mm -hmm. here we respect them a lot mm -hmm. but also let them be given 
peers to choose what they want to produce and where they want it to come from. And that's why we are also encouraging the government, much as we have the certified uh, bodies to do the certification of seeds, we also want to have uh, the uh, farmer uh, groups coming up with their own seed banks and they come up with their own seeds, indigenous uh, type of seeds, yes. that they can be allowed to grow. That if there's any way that certification can be done in that uh, in that angle, mm -hmm. then it will now assure the consumer out there of choosing mm -hmm. what to what to what to purchase from the market, having known the source of that food. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I want to stay with you, and it's a good thing that you talked about markets because uh, when you talk about uh, choice, uh, convenience, safety, and then you look at the state of our wet markets, for example, uh, look at the informal nature of uh, these markets by roadsides. Uh, in places where the basic needs of uh, sanitary and, and hygiene are barely met. Uh, think of our butcheries and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, the way we handle meat at uh, Bama in the mornings and that sort of thing. Uh, th this sorts of uh, portends a bit of chaos uh, in the space that we are talking about. Where do you think the challenge has been? Um, the challenge is, as I began, is that consumers have not been brought on board. Uh -huh. That's challenge number one. Yeah. Number two, that whatever we do, like now our laws are fragmented and we don't have a one-stop shop yeah. where we can go and channel the issues to do with food safety, the food systems. There's no one specific place that we can channel that. Mm -hmm. And that's why, as an organization, we've been very keen on looking at and also following very closely to ensure that the food safety policy is passed. Mm -hmm. Actually, it started being developed in 2021. Shouldn't this yes. have been sort of automatic development because we can see uh, tarmac roads, uh, we can see power, we can see power lines. Uh, maybe we would have expected that our markets would then develop from the Stone Age into the modern era, and get into buildings, uh, provide space as we build and plan our cities and that sort of thing ideally that's how it's it, it was supposed to be yes. uh, it's supposed to be but apparently we took a ground as we said again yes. they're different uh -huh. so what do we do we cannot continue now complaining but be yes. part of the solution mm -hmm. and what we are uh, presenting as a solution is to ensure that the markets and the systems are now enshrined in our policies uh -huh. in our laws mm -hmm. and uh, basically mm -hmm. like as an organization in Kajedo County we have partnered with the county yes. to come up with four agriculture bills where mm -hmm. we have really tried to align whatever is supposed to happen to ensure the safety of food uh, that is sold in the market. Mm -hmm. But this one we would also want to ask uh, the COG to replicate in other counties so mm -hmm. that it's enshrined in the, in the, in the laws of this, uh, this country and whether national or county. Mm -hmm. But ideally also enforcement is an issue. Yes. Enforcement in a, is an issue. And when we go around we are being told that uh, it it's this little that is allocated to the agriculture sector. Mm -hmm. And remember, we are ideally supposed to be having at least 10% allocated to the agriculture sector. Mm -hmm. But in some counties, I'm sorry to say that it's 1.5 to 3%. Mm -hmm. um, that is quite minimal. How, how much of this do you think actually goes to the value addition aspect? Because production is one thing, but uh, selling the smokies, the eggs, uh, the chicken, the beef, uh, the boiled maize, uh, in, in, in fact, in some instances, it's actually been proven that these are serious health hazards, harboring everything from E. coli to uh, being yeah. hazard and that sort of thing. Uh, quite little is being channeled towards that, and that's mm -hmm. why we are not even getting enough staff, enough personnel mm -hmm. to to do the enforcement bit of it. Yes. If we had that and also proper sensitization about the health hazards that comes alongside what happens, then that would really place us in a very good position as a country to assure consumers of the safety of, mm -hmm. of the products in the market. But until then, we cannot stop at this. We have to continue encouraging and sensitizing and fighting going forward to mm -hmm. ensure that all those aspects are enshrined in our policies, but more so yes. ensure that we have enough personnel mm -hmm. to go out. Ideally, what we do as an organization is yes. we are trying to assist the government. Mm -hmm. The core mandate of government is to ensure that the consumers know their rights mm -hmm. and their responsibilities too. Yes. yes. And maybe that is being done or not being done. I want to bring in uh, Samuel now. And the, 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 the fact of the matter has been that with all those challenges in that space then, uh, most people have opted to take matters into their own hands and say, we want to eat organic. 
and are thus starting to look for foods that are uh, treated, dealt with, handled, planted in what they say is a sustainable way, in a way that uh, uh, gels with their values. Uh, talk to us about uh, this space, uh, what it means, and why we have such a big uh, sort of, I'll say, a focus from people who are feeling that, uh, that there's a challenge in the food system. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh -huh. The organic food market um, by February this year yes. was about uh, 400 billion euros uh, worth of market. Mm -hmm. And the, it That's has been great. growing uh, globally. Yes. And it has been growing over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, there has been a uh, growing um, you know, consumer uh, demand for organic products. Yes. And uh, simply because of what you're talking about, mm. people are not sure uh, how safe is their food. And uh, people asking what is organic in the first place. And the uh, organic system generally is a system where you grow food without using synthetic pesticides mm -hmm. and uh, chemical fertilizers. Mm -hmm. While at the same time you are, you are taking care of the environment. Uh, you are not uh, destroying, uh, for example, natural vegetation. You are also taking care of the water bodies and the, and the rivers mm -hmm. and the streams. Yes. And, and also looking at the social justice uh, part that uh, within the, uh, what we call fair, fair trade, within the, uh, the, the value chain uh, system. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in Kenya, for example, we have seen growth of organic uh, market since 2007 when we developed the East African Organic Product Standards. Mm -hmm. And it was domesticated in Kenya uh, through assessment by Kenya Bureau of Standards. Mm -hmm. And it has been growing from something like 164 farmers doing organic farming to currently about 50,000 farmers who are doing certified organic farming. Mm -hmm. And about uh, 300,000 farmers doing organic are uh, not certified, but they are they're using organic farming, farming practices. Yes. And uh, in terms of organic market, it has been growing. Uh, when we started as Kwan in 2005, there was, there was no shop that you, where you could buy organic produce. Mm -hmm. But now the, there are even supermarkets like California Supermarket where you can get an organic section and you can buy organic food. Mm -hmm. There are hotels and restaurants where you can buy organic food. So the demand is there? And there are organic farmers markets mm -hmm. also, um, about 15 of them. Mm -hmm. So the demand and also the uh, provision by farmers has been growing you know, over the years. Mm -hmm. And uh, as Kwan, as what we are trying to do is uh, to see how would we bring in, as uh, my colleague says, uh, communicate consumers mm -hmm. so that they can be able to know that this is an organic product. Uh, they identify this organic product and know where they can buy organic product. Mm -hmm. You know, we would like a situation where in every, you know, um, uh, market you, you can walk in, you can actually get a section of organic produce. Mm -hmm. That gives you a choice that you can either buy uh, non-organic or organic products. Mm -hmm. And we are working with the counties, like, uh, you know, Moranga County, uh, Busia County, and other counties to see how this can be done. Um, and for example, in Moranga County, in, uh, in three markets, we have got uh, a section where you, uh, consumers can go and buy organic produce. Mm -hmm. And that's what we, we, are, we are communicating and encouraging other counties to join in. Mm -hmm. And there, so that we can have organic being not being uh, seen as an right um, type of food, but uh, food for the common monarchy, mm -hmm. where every Kenyan can be able to buy organic produce from where uh, he, he or she goes to buy his, his produce. Mm -hmm. And in terms of identification, yes. we have also developed a, a mark, uh, we call it Kirimuhai mark. Mm -hmm. uh, this mark is uh, to identify organic products in the market mm -hmm. so that uh, consumers can easily uh, identify this is certified organic product and this is not certified. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad you talked about uh, it being a lit because often you find that there's a premium to be charged uh, on the basis of it being organic. Uh, do you think that as the market grows, the prices will come down so that it becomes a thing that then everyone can afford? Yeah, uh, because I mean the price is a, a function of demand and supply. Yes. And right now, because there are fewer farmers than consumers, of course that drives the, the pricing mm -hmm. or the prices. And what we are doing is uh, promoting uh, organic farming am among many farmers so that you can have many farmers producing organic. We would like to see organic as a normal product, mm -hmm. not as a premium product. Yes. Because every consumer has a right to eat, you know, good food, quality mm -hmm. food. Mm -hmm. Food does not, that does not have uh, chemical residues in it. Yes. And, you know, organic is what, um, you know, guarantees that this food is, does not have chemicals in it. Mm -hmm. But, of course, I don't say that the other food has a chemicals, but yes. uh, organic is uh, comes through a system yes. uh, where 
their standards yes. and the farmers apply the standards on their farm and they are certified yes. so they are audited mm -hmm. and when the audit is being done then they are checked whether they are complying to these standards mm -hmm. and uh, therefore at the end they, they get the certificate yes, you can to, be yeah, assured yeah to be sure that they, they are following the standards mm -hmm. yeah I, I want to bring in Louise now and the fact of the matter is that everything that they have talked about mm -hmm. uh, is, is indicating that uh, farming is now business in fact that agriculture is big big business as a person who's in the space where you uh, consult and help farmers really uh, commercialize their art their agriculture uh, talk to us about uh, the space in Kenya, uh, whether there's actually, because we used to have extension officers, they're no longer there now. So are you being able to step into that gap, uh, into that breach, and be able to cap capacitate, build farmers, uh, to be able to treat uh, farming as a real business? Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, farming, farming entirely is a business, mm -hmm. right from production to consumption. Uh, at the production level, you, you will find that uh, most farmers are producing crops because uh, they want to sell to get money mm -hmm. uh, during the distribution of this cr of, of these pr products from the from the farm again this is also another business entirely yes. and also during the production or manufacturing of the pesticide this is also another avenue by which agribusiness comes in uh, you realize that uh, when we talk about farming as a business that is now agribusiness yes. uh, we are trying to interpret the seeds that are basically are in the shells of the agrovet. Mm -hmm. And these seeds, we are, be, we are turning them into money. How do you do this? First of all, you need to, to identify the, the market. Mm -hmm. So before production, you need to identify the market. That is what we normally call a feasibility study yes. uh, in product, before production. So feasibility study is very important to every farmer on what you want to produce, on which kind of agribusiness venture you would like to, to get into. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I was asking myself, why is it that nowadays we do not have cotton, yet cotton is a very lucrative uh, venture? Why is it, we, why is it that we, we have pishori rice in Moya and not Ahero? Why mm -hmm. are they not doing pishori rice? Yes. So you again come to the point of there, is a, there are very many determinants into mm -hmm. farming. Mm -hmm. So, and this is where most farmers get it wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you'll, you'll find that a farmer wants to do rice, but the place where he wants to do rice is not very adequate or very conducive, uh, conducive yes. for that rice. Mm -hmm. Number two, the farmers are not trained or educated or information not passed, mm -hmm. uh, like Dr. Thari was saying. Uh, they, are not, they have not been trained on the kind of crops that does well in various uh, places. Mm -hmm. So you will find that there are, there are institutions and companies like the Apple Farm Solutions. What we do, we educate uh, the farmers. Yes. We provide information to the farmers on what they need to do. Basically, from the, from the point of soil science, we, we help the farmers, we tell them that before you get into production, it's very important for you to understand your, your soil. You do not get into production before understanding the soil. Mm -hmm. Understand the soil. After understanding the soil, then you, uh, your soil will define which kind of crop you need to grow. Mm -hmm. After you've identified that, then it's very important for you now to uh, do the cost analysis. Mm -hmm. How much do you need? Then after that, now identify where you need to get your products. After identification of the of where you need to get the products, then identify the market. It's uh -huh. very important. You don't uh, you don't skip any step. That is now in, uh, what we comprise what will comprise the feasibility studies. Mm -hmm. So uh, we encourage farmers as much as it's very important to get into farming. You can turn this into a lucrative business by making sure that you involve experts and professionals at every step of the journey, mm -hmm. and uh, from production until consumption. So. Uh, I would just summarize that by saying that agribusiness is a, is a school on its own. Yes. It's a very big school on its own. So it entails a lot of things and uh, a lot of determin determinants. Um, farmers make it wrong by getting into farming with the idea of the mindset of money, yes. not the mm -hmm. challenges involved, yes. not the process. So it's about the money, not the process. But when we understand the process, it is the process that gives rise to the money. You don't focus on the money without focusing on the process. Mm -hmm. So the entire process of production is very important. The entire process of distribution is very important. The entire process of consumption is very important. Uh -huh. So we need to understand all these aspects as much as agribusiness is concerned and as much as uh, fa making farming as a venture that uh -huh. is lucrative, that can turn uh -huh. uh, the soil into a fortune. So uh -huh. 
it's very important that we consider all these factors. Okay, Louise, mm. indeed, uh, of course, the fact of the matter is that uh, as younger and younger people get into yes. agriculture, mm. then uh, they are able to grasp uh, technology better, they're able to grasp the concepts that we're talking about better, mm -hmm. hence creating new opportunities yes. for both, of course, the food safety aspect and, of course, things like uh, uh, understanding concepts like organic farming and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to go to a short break, but when we come back, I think the issue of technology uh, farming and its place in enabling farmers farm holistically, I think, will uh, make good fodder for us. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe just hold your thoughts on that. But... Uh, we want to go to a short commercial break now. Uh, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes, so stay with us here on uh, Farm Kenya. Airtel money ina kuokolea. Really? Uki withdraw chapa kwa Airtel money agent ina kurudishia hiyo transaction fee kama airtime. Fanti. Karibu. Airtel money makes your life kidogo better. This week on Manspective Africa. I went to a sleep study test. So they pull machines on me when I was sleeping. Then the results, when I went to the ENT doc, she told me, you're lucky you're alive. Mm. Huh? Yes. I said, yeah, you have something called um, sleep apnea. Kids today, they think they know so much. Mm. It's a very difficult uh, period for fatherhood. Mm. Because when you talk, they will tell you like, okay, this is your reasoning, but also this is my reason. You know, men, the way our brains work is yeah. so different. Mm. I'm seeing you looking at these young men yes. and realizing you're about to make one of the biggest mistakes of your of life. Your life yes. But instead of pointing out the problem, you let you, you already have the solution. Yes. But you're letting them <laughs> tell you the solution that you already have. Yeah. So is your name really Ghost? Don't I look like one? <laughs> <laughs> Only on KTN Home. Charge on your current bouquet and get upgraded to the next high bouquet for one month. Download Star Times on app for unlimited entertainment. Anytime, anywhere. Star Times. Enjoy digital life. Now, before anyone else is killed. I got one in the mail yesterday and Kendra, she got one before she was murdered. That's not Daniel, that is Jason. Hey! I prefer to leave police matters to the police. What the hell is that? There's a single fingerprint. Not any of this. Really? Not one. Whoever did all this, they have woven a very tangled web. Twisted story of revenge that will steal your heart. A daughter will bear the punishment for the sins of her mother. Vengeance is soon going to be mine. Their lives will be ruined, and a daughter will bear the punishment. This is not a love story. It is a story of hearts broken by revenge. Oh, Mary. So what? Broken faith. Only on KTN Home. Sasa mama, niko na mifunjika? Yep, sitaweza kufanya homework. Mbona kani kwa una furaha hiyo story? I mean sitaweza kufanya homework. Wewe, kwani ni macho imevunjika? Utaweza kusoma vitabu, usifikiri utatoka shule ukuje hapa kucheza. 
ukitaka kufanya kitu ifanye saa hii hisi ati kungoja sijui stars ya line na hiyo ni ufala you know what you're right kuna kitu nimekuwa nikitaka kufanya for a long time but kwa nikiogopa ni madrama tu Thank you indeed for staying with us here on Farm Kenya. My name is Peter Akaba. On this second part of the show, we will, of course, delve uh, deeper into the food safety conversation, focusing more on the aspects of youth technology and indeed food transformation, food systems transformation governance, a conversation, of course, that uh, a lot of people want to chip in on. Of course, we are on various social media platforms, so do, of course, uh, get out there and give us your thoughts. You can look uh, for Farm Kenya and, of course, become part of the conversation. Uh, my guests are still here. Of course, uh, Dr. Alice Kiamonto, Executive Director, Consumer Grassroots Association, and uh, Samuel Ndongo, who is Programs Manager at the Kenya Organic Network, Agriculture Network, CON, and Luis Likiomondi of Japur Farm Solutions. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's get uh, cracking with it. And of course, before we went on the break, we were talking about uh, the youth and uh, transformation. Uh, but the fact of the matter has been that, Alice, the average age of a Kenyan farmer has been 64, 65. Uh, it, it would be a challenge to expect them to ingest some of the things that we are talking about in terms of uh, uh, food systems, chemicals, uh, technology at that age, but the opportunity then is for younger farmers to take up the mantle and move this forward. Do you think then we can bring in the conversation that uh, as younger and younger people get into farming, uh, they can then begin to tackle the things we're talking about holistically? Yeah, thanks so much, Peter. Uh, it's true indeed that when you're talking about farmers in Kenya right now, you talk of people from 50 years and above. And um, it's saddening that uh, most of our people, our young people, are um, into things that may, yes, they may earn them something, but when it comes to food uh, production, then it, uh, they, 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 it's, it's little that they can contribute to that. Uh -huh. And for this reason, we want to encourage as many farmers uh, to also pass on uh, the technology and the techniques to the young people, but also call upon the young people to come on board and uh, let them uh, embrace farming. Uh, not only just at the local level, but we want also the government to um, have centers uh, of excellency and let young people come, let them be trained and let them uptake agriculture, even going a step higher, just like in Tanzania, what has happened there, that they have set aside a piece of land for young people to come and do farming. Uh -huh. Because in Kenya, uh, acquiring a piece of land or leasing a piece of land to do farming is a bit expensive. If government can come in that way and encourage young people to come and do farming, and of course embrace them technology. We can't uh, run away from technology, depending on which sort of technology also it's uh, subject to discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, that way we can encourage as many young farmers to come on board and produce food for, uh, for the country, for themselves, for their families, because we are looking at sustainability. If we talk of sustainability, we cannot take away the issue of the young people coming on board to do farming. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, someone. Are young people getting into organic farming? Is it easier to deal with a young farmer as an organization, essentially getting them through the certification adherence to the production standards and that sort of thing? Yeah, definitely it's easier. Uh, of course, young people have um, quite some challenges entering into, into farming. Mm -hmm. 
For example, they don't uh, have resources to do that. Yes, capital. Uh, capital and also mm -hmm. resources in terms of the farm, as, as yeah. Dr. is saying. So I, I think we need to work together to see how, for example, they can have access to you know capital mm -hmm. so that they can be able to start that. In terms of uh, absorbing the technology and being able, for example, to follow the standards, it's actually very easy for us to work with the young people mm -hmm. because also organic uh, certification requires that the farmers keep records mm -hmm. uh, and you know as people ages they, they, they are not able to keep records mm -hmm. so we see young people as uh, people who can really embrace organic agriculture mm -hmm. um, although and, and we are working towards this that uh, as um, we were talking about you know agriculture agribusiness is not just farming but also other, providing other services along the value chain. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, yeah, the youth can be involved in, for example, marketing. Uh, you know, nowadays we, we have, nowadays we have uh, e-platforms yes. where they can be able to, you know, use their phones and then be able to sell organic products online. And uh, we have come up with an organic e platform where young people can be able to tap into and be able to sell their products through the platform. Mm -hmm. And the same, same case for organic inputs. Because, you know, uh, farmers have a challenge of getting organic inputs. So availing those inputs in a, in a platform where farmers can go and check, click what the inputs they want to buy. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we can engage uh, the youth there to do deliveries, for example, for the inputs. Yes. So what we need to do is to make this farming to be more of trendy so that uh, young people can be able to engage in. For example, instead of, uh, you know, farming outside, uh, you know, farming, you can have greenhouse farming. Uh, you know, where in a small piece of land, um, a young person can be able to earn more money from farming through intensification, uh, you know, the system that he's using. Um, therefore, I think we have a role, and I see organic farming as, as a technology, a new farming system mm -hmm. where young people can embrace and provide services along the value chain yes. from the provision of inputs to, you know, uh, doing uh, selling and, and even, even, um, being able to promote the, the organic products in the market and therefore they can make a living out of that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, through such practices. Okay. Uh, Luis, is your organization then having the conversation with the, the youth that agriculture is not just production, but various aspects of different roles along the value uh, chain and the, uh, along the production system and even within the supply chain? Uh, well, let me begin by appreciating first the government. Mm -hmm. uh, the reintroduction of the this the new system of education. Yes. Uh, we we were we were heading somewhere where we were losing a lot of youths uh, getting into farming because of our ed education system. Mm -hmm. uh, with the coming of the C B C we have seen even young children as young as four years in schools. Yes they are now being taught on how to do small farming, the kitchen gardening, the sack farming. Mm -hmm. We have been seeing that on a lot on the social media. So that one, uh, mine is to first to appreciate the government for that kind of initiative and that kind of transition. Mm -hmm. uh, again, to add on it, uh, we need to understand that times have changed. We are living at such a time whereby the, the age the age or rather our people are no longer living long. Yes. Back then we would have quite a lot of people getting to 100 years plus. Mm -hmm. uh, right now you get a, a person at 60 years is already old. Uh, that means we are, we are not living long like those who were there previously before the mm -hmm. 2000s. So mm -hmm. that means we have quite a lot of youths. Yes. And if we have quite a lot of youths, uh, previously, we had a lot of uh, old people into farming. Yes. But now that the generation and the time is changing very fast, uh, currently we are we are now into AI, mm -hmm. the artificial intelligence. Yes. Uh, I'm just surprised that I'm not seeing many content creators getting contents to do with farming or agriculture. Yes. Uh, we are majorly into music, entertainment, but we are not doing a lot of uh, content on agriculture to promote agriculture. Mm -hmm. If we can advocate for most content creators, both on TikTok, the Facebook, the Twitters, to uh, do content creation on agriculture, I think this will also motivate the younger generation to get into farming. Number two, mm -hmm. 
uh, as a as a company that is Japur Farm Solutions. There are quite a lot of things we we are doing. One, uh, we have we have created a platform that is called Japur Academy. Japur yes. Academy is an initiative where we are trying to get our youths to to do e-learning on courses that are agriculture related. Mm -hmm. For instance, we are providing short courses like mushroom farming. Yes. Uh, I remember I the last time I ate mushroom was when I was about five or ten years there. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've not been seeing mushroom a lot. Uh, these are some of the things that we need to get into because if you incorporate organic farming or inorganic farming mm -hmm. uh, with these kind of uh, farming met methods, yes. uh, then we will have food. Number so we are trying to create a platform that is uh, geared towards providing e-learning. Most yes. of our youths have nowadays access to smartphones and the laptops. Mm -hmm. They can easily uh, learn even agriculture. You realize that the other, uh, back in 2020, uh, we, we, were at, we were held hostage by the COVID. So most people were not going uh, to work. We were not uh, gathering. Okay. So uh, we were doing oh. most of our stuff within the house. So providing e-learning, for example, when you train somebody on how to do sack farming, that person can raise their own food. Yes. When you, pr when you train somebody uh, on things to do for, with BSF, that is the black soldier flies. Yes. These are things that the youth can do. The youth need to understand that the future is in agriculture. As mm -hmm. much as uh, content creation is concerned, the future yes. is in agriculture. You can never go wrong in agriculture. Yes. There is no uh, day people will stop eating. Yes. So uh, we are trying to leverage on social media and other platforms to encourage our youths mm -hmm. to get into farming. Uh, when you go to Japo yes, Farm Solutions have, Facebook, yes. mm -hmm. you realize that our platform reaches. Uh, by today, I was I was talking to my my friend here mm -hmm. that by today I was, when I was checking our platform, it. We, were reach, we reached 28.1 million. Mm -hmm. That means our Facebook platform reaches quite a lot of people. Yes. So we get quite a lot of questions across the uh, globally. Mm -hmm. And some of these questions yes. are coming from the youth. So it's very important we uh, combine technology yes. that is youth-oriented, and then we mm -hmm. integrate it into agriculture. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, indeed, uh, quite an insightful conversation. And I think a good place to end it, uh, saying that agriculture is indeed the future. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but uh, to remind you that we'll invite you back into studio to okay. take this conversation forward, especially from the point of view of engaging the youth in this aspect of agriculture uh, that continue to indeed uh, drive uh, food security and food safety. Thank you all for taking the time to speak to us here. Uh, before we go, we of course have our usual segment, which is uh, the farm guide and farmer of the day. And today the Ministry of Agriculture has warned that the country faces a serious shortage of livestock feed and fodder and sustainable measures are needed to reverse this situation. Now, many farmers in Kenya have resorted to feeding their livestock with low quality grains and more, which has resulted in reduced animal productivity. Now, it's against this background that uh, John Curry of Maximum Milk Production Solution Africa had sought to grow a super napier grass variety known as Pak Chong One, that is not just drought and flood resistant, but also nutritious and palatable to a wide range of livestock. Our reporter Paul Thiongo has more. One of the biggest challenges that most livestock farmers face, if not all, is the cost of feeds. And not just the cost of feeds, but the quality of those feeds. Today, we are in Kiambu County, focusing on a new variety of napier grass. And to tell us more about it, we are going to welcome John from uh, Maximum Milk Production. Solutions, Solutions Africa. Africa. Yes. Hi John, how are you? I'm fine. Actually, our farm is a supermarket. So you'll get a variety of crops, high quality. You'll get super K vines, you'll get super nipia grass, you'll get siabaza grass, you'll get kikuyu grass. Let's talk about this super, super nipia grass. Yeah. Why do you call it super? Why is it super? What qualities are making it that super? It is super because of, first of all, the biomass. It produces up to 200 tons per acre per year. It has also very high growth rate. Within oh. mm -hmm. 45 to 60 days you harvest. When you talk about biomass, kindly, what is biomass? Mm -hmm. Biomass is what you get from the harvesting of that crop. Right. If you compare this one and the ordinary Napier that all of us know, mm -hmm. you will see the difference. Mm -hmm. One stem like this yes. will give you a very big stem. We shall 
see one there mm -hmm. you shall see one there yes so well, that is what you are talking about yeah. the other thing mm -hmm. is the palatability and hardly mm -hmm. this napier grass does not have the hairs that steam yes and why is it uh, the way it's been it was developed in the developed, uh -huh. by crossing elephant napier grass and uh, african elephant napier grass by the way mm -hmm. with the palmillet that give it the white leaves that it has mm -hmm. you also find that it has very smooth leaves and stems mm -hmm. it only have some hairs between the leaf and the stem actually. all right all right yeah then harvesting you do six to eight times a year the ordinary one used to do three times yes so throughout the year and you'll be harvesting either in cold areas mm -hmm. hot areas mm -hmm. like here is a semi-arid area yes. east. Yeah. and uh, if you see our farm farms are very very green as long as you feed this fodder properly with animal manure, yeah. then you are there. Okay. The first planting you harvest after 75 to 90 days, but this one is barely 60 days. Mm. So it is ready for harvesting, for feeding of animals, or for silaging, because we do also silage. Mm -hmm. We do uh, bale silages. Uh, we have machines that we do that. Okay. So we do that and sell to the farmers. All right. You can imagine this is not even 60 days. It is 2.2 meters. Wow. If you go to a colder area, maybe it will be 1.7. Mm -hmm. So we don't look at the, at the sorry, you, you don't look at the, the, height, the height normally. Yeah. You look at the, the dates. dates. So if you planted today, 75 to 90 days harvest. After the first cut, do 45 to 60. The other thing, maybe if a person who might not be able to remember the dates, just look at the time it is starting to produce some canes. The first, second cane like that one you see there mm -hmm. you harvest at that time that time that cane will be a source of energy for an animal because dairy and beef cows they require a lot of energy a lot of proteins a lot of starch and a lot of uh, minerals this nephew is a whole meal has that so the energy in these canes the ones that not this one this is a it's just a seed eh? the one that uh, will be uh, uh, the, the, the two i talked about there yes. will be the source of energy because yeah. if you Uma this cane like this, <laughs> it is sugar. All oh, right. Yeah, yeah. We did a lab test with Caro. They came to our farm and took samples. We got a whooping 16.6 percent. We did another one. It got 18.9. Then we got another one that <coughs> with the Jaquat. Mm -hmm. Well, Jaquat there is a, 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 a department with Chinese there known as Solajek. They picked and it got 24. That was about one and a half months with 24 percent crude protein that crude is what protein i wanted to know what percentages these are yeah. crude, crude protein crude protein all right when you have quality the most expensive thing we buy from this feed shop is protein found in what we call it so you reduce that if you reduce buying that because it's tea is very expensive yes yes if when you reduce that it means the farmer will reduce the cost of production i'm not saying you eliminate 100 mm percent -hmm. no because you cannot be eating well every day mm. you need to eat rice you need to eat it very yes, like that yes. but what you are simply saying is the cost of production will definitely go down all right we have farmers in uh, northeastern we are doing products with this meat. the meat that we are getting the cows that we are very good cows you are getting they are doing feedlots there the the, the 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 sheep we call the gala gala goods not sheep mm. gala goods mm. we have people in narrow buying a lot of this to rear the sheep, the dopa sheep. It is a very good nepia and I wish everybody can get this. What should I look out for when I'm coming to buy the seedling? So the seedling or the cutting, mm -hmm. uh, the standard is, is two nodes. The two nodes eh, are these ones. This is a node, this is a node. Mm -hmm. This is a node, this is a node. That okay. is a standard measure. That is what Dr. Kerai Skedong advised us. That you should plant a two nodes cutting, no, no, not more than that. Okay. It is very important in planting because mm -hmm. it it, it produces roots mm -hmm. and shoots. Oh. Then this bit here yes. is the one that provides food when it is growing to this. Okay. So if, oh. for example, you know some farmer might want to multiply and you cut it here, yes. it will not germinate. So you, you cut, it, they are done by our, 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 our professionals. We have, fa, fa, in, in your farms, we have a, a professional agronomist and the workers. Eh? Mm -hmm. They are shown how to do it. Mm. So this is the standard. If you touch here, it will rot. Okay, for now we are just going to be demonstrate what you call the mtaro. The mtaro method. The mtaro method. The mtaro method. The mtaro means trench. The trench. Know? Yes. Yes. It is the most cheapest 
and the conventional one. Mm -hmm. And that is why today we are not going to demonstrate using the 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 the, 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 the tumbukiza one. Eh? All right. Tumbukiza is the hole. The hole which one. Which you said is how many feet it and is how many feet? intensive, two feet by two feet by two feet. You require a lot of manure. Okay. This one, a farmer without too much money to buy manure, yes. you'll be able to plant then feed it his or her crop. Uh, pole pole. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, we have our trench here. Yes. So maybe we can just uh, demonstrate using this. Uh, I will this show one. you how to plant. Right. You see this one. Mm -hmm. If you look at it, there is an, the upper side and the lower side. If you plant it uh, or upside down, mm -hmm. it will not germinate. Wait, wait, hold on. What? If you look at it, uh -huh. it will tell you without using your own eyes. There is an upside and there is a lower side. Look at it like this. Even this one. This is the lower side, this is the upper side. You look at it, it is showing. Uh, upper side so, and lower side. Yeah. For me, there is if no you, difference. Oh, there okay. is. There is. There is. You, is you can see even this shoot is looking up. up this, so oh, if you up. plant the other way like this, okay. it will not germinate. Oh. And if it germinates, you are very lucky. Mm -hmm. I can remember there is a farmer who bought and uh, planted upside down. He said, yeah, as he may. As he may. We but uh, we went there, we sent a team, okay. and uh, he was assisted. Good. So basically, let mm -hmm. me show you how we plant. Eh? Yeah. This lower part yeah. will be buried. You bury like that bar up to that point. It, bar it, bar so it, the second it, node, it, uh -huh. the second node is left up, up, touching the ground. This is about an angle of uh, 25 <laughs> degrees. All right, like left it, like that. Yeah. When you leave it like this side, should touch the soil like that. Mm -hmm. When you plant like that, you have done it perfectly. Okay. Yep. And we say the spacing is between. Then from here mm -hmm. should be now three feet. Three feet. This three feet. Yeah. So this is where you do the other. This one. Oh, so three feet. So three me feet. okay, measure like three that. feet. Measure if you don't have feet. a tape measure or you uh, don't have a, you you will do about a meter max. Okay. Then you see that one. It should touch the ground mm -hmm. like that, like that. Oh, the, okay. This the, line, this line should, should touch, touch the, the ground. soil. Okay, yeah. good. Then good. we do the third one uh -huh. and the last one for today, like that. Take the soil. The ground should be left, and this one should be left touching the ground like that. Okay. okay. That is a properly. A planted supernapier grass, mm -hmm. it will give you maximum. All right. So, uh, okay, for, for now we didn't use any manure. This was just for demonstration yeah. purposes. But make sure to use farmyard manure. When you have farmyard manure, what you do, you mix this soil you had, uh, you had dug. Yes. You mix it well inside the hole mm -hmm. and then plant your cutting there. Okay. Like that. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. And you say, just to repeat, the spacing is? Three by three feet. Three, three feet apart. Three feet between the the, the plants, the the the, 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 the cuttings. Yes, this is a product of this one only. Yeah. So if you didn't give it enough, these are like almost two, how many tillers? One, two. Can we try to count? Oh, these are. So you many. can't count. Yeah. It's more than two hundred tillers. Eh? From only one. This way we are saying there is no other grass in the world that is more vegetative than supernapia. Look at this. See. That's and then very easy for handling. And this is just how many days old? This is 60 days, 60 days since we cut. Right. So you can see this, eh? If you don't la leave enough space for it to expand, mm. you'll be having problems. So I can also hug it. You say that... Yeah, uh, you can hug it. Me, right? Yeah, no sting here. I'm going to have a problem, sorry. I hope not today, so... Yeah. Good. Very smooth leaves, you can see. Yes, I can see. They're very, very, yeah. very, very smooth. The best nipia grass. Actually, it is dubbed as the king of all nipia grasses in the world. So in as much as I'm a young person, and uh, mostly the advice trickles down from the older generation to the younger generation, I've seen quite a number of older people, retired teachers, retired um, civil servants, coming in to um, agribusiness, not just agriculture, but agribusiness, coming to uh, companies like ourselves, taking such machinery and improving the productivity of their farms. The old methods are not sustainable. We are living in a generation where if you're left behind, it will take so much time before you actually catch up. So my advice to them is to be able to embrace new technologies, not to fear them, to, be, to take the time to do their research, to take the time to know um, when they actually need to start stepping up their game. Because 
they have taught us quite a bit and they know we can't go forward just as a youth by ourselves. So my advice to them would be to run and to take up all these new technologies and run with them and let's do this together because the market is big, Kenya is big. Well, of course, uh, wonderful insights there from that young farmer and, of course, uh, from uh, our very own Paul Bongo, um, Bogwa there hugging some uh, uh, green napier grass. So maybe just getting in touch with the farmers and the crop itself. That brings us to the end of this conversation for today on Farm Kenya. It has been a pleasure. And to remind you that we'll be back again tomorrow at the same time with much, much more from the world of agriculture from across the country and from across East Africa. And of course, to say thank you very much from, uh, to our panelists, Dr. Alice Kamunto, Executive Director of the Consumer Grassroots Association, uh, Samuel Ndungu, who's a program manager at the Kenya Organic uh, Agriculture Network, and of course, Luis Likio Monti from Japur Farm Solutions. Asante Nisana. Thank you for making the time. Thank you. Well, indeed, from us here in studio, it is Kwaheri. See you again tomorrow, and do continue to enjoy the rest of your view. Lima Ardi, Lima Pulima, Kuam Shin, Kuana Wapi Pasas.